Good morning. This is Senate Judiciary, and it's Tuesday, April 6th. Senator Sears is away on an appointment. He'll be back at 11. Um, but this morning, we're picking up H-18, an act relating to sexual exploitation of children, and um, considering amending that with language from S-103, um, so-called Good Samaritan language. So we do have Michelle Childs with us from Legislative Council. And good morning, Senator White. And uh, Michelle is going to walk us through the language of 103. Can you put that up on the screen, Michelle? Sure. Can everyone see that? Yeah. OK. So good morning, everybody. Um, I'm going to start out actually talking a little bit about another provision of law that you have, Title 18, uh, as it relates to uh, possession of regulated drugs. And I think most of you will, will remember, it was about eight years ago, the General Assembly uh, passed a Good Samaritan law uh, with regard to reporting uh, drug overdoses and you uh, establish some limited immunity from liability for certain crimes, specifically for drug crimes, uh, for lower level possession. Um, if someone called to either report that they were experiencing an overdose or someone uh, that they were around for reporting an overdose and that they could report that without fear um, that they would be prosecuted for possession of a regulated drug. And so the legislature had made a policy decision to wanted to kind of prioritize the safety of, of that person who is in a medical emergency. And you didn't want people to be discouraged from calling and reporting that overdose because of a fear of prosecution for drugs that may be on the premises. And so this is, this is the same idea, except it applies to um, either survivors who are engaged in, uh, uh, who are part of human trafficking or a, a victim of human trafficking or um, uh, people who are engaged in sex work. And so what you have here, if you have a new addition to the prostitution and lewdness chapter, so you have immunity from liability, you'll see in section one, um, the under the definitions, we're just using, referring to existing definitions of human trafficking and for prostitution. You'll see subsection B at the bottom of page one. So a person who, in, in these terms, we can go back and we can look at how the, the terms are used in the same way that they are, have been used at the, the other law that we've had operating for eight years. Um, if you do want to hear from someone um, uh, in law enforcement, you might want to check with the states, with the attorney general's office, with David Scher, because it was initially uh, the the attorney general who brought the original Good Sam law proposal to the General Assembly. And my recollection was that when this passed, because this exact language passed the House last biennium, mm -hmm. and I think just got derailed because of COVID and other more pressing matters. And um, but the my recollection was that the attorney general's office uh, testified in support of the language and was comfortable with the standard that was being used currently in the Title 18 provision. So you see in subsection B, a person who in good faith and in a timely manner reports to law enforcement that the person is a victim of or a witness to a crime that arose from the person's involvement in prostitution or human trafficking uh, shall not be cited, arrested, or prosecuted for a violation of the following offenses. And then it lists uh, prostitution as well as prohibited conduct, prohibited conduct being that lowest level um, sex offense that oftentimes other offenses are pled down to. Um, it has a general lewdness uh, aspect to it, and we can pull up that language at some point if you want to take a look at it. And then the other offenses are uh, related to lower level possession of a regulated drug. And I see on page two, line five, I got a I think this is based on what had passed the House, and we probably drafted it last year. So it, um, the legislature directed my office uh, to change the term marijuana throughout the titles to cannabis based on 
last year's adoption of Act 164. So I have done that and I'll just update that if you decide to move forward with this proposal. So it's all, it's not an, uh, uh, an exemption from liability for all crimes. It is only pertaining to these specific possession crimes as well as prostitution and prohibited conduct. Okay, so I just want to make sure so that it's not that if you were, uh, if there was an aggravated assault or something like that, that it would provide immunity for those particular offenses. So um, before we leave that list, Michelle, yep. I, I'm assuming that this long laundry list of um, drug possessions that would be immunized comes from testimony saying that that's the most common reason why people don't report is that they're they're worried that drugs that are in the environment will be found um i think anecdotally that yes that is is uh, the case is that if there's drugs on the premises let's say if you have someone who is a um who is a sex worker and they are with a client and the client was violent or engaged in something that the um that the sex worker wanted to report, but perhaps there were drugs on the premises, the principle is to make sure that that person doesn't fail to report the crime or that they're in danger because they're worried that they would get charged with a drug crime. Mm -hmm. It goes back to um, a couple of years, or two or three years ago, and there was a, a study, and I have to go back and look, but it was the AG's office, I think, working with the Network Against Domestic and Sexual Violence, and I think the Center for Crime Victim Services on certain recommendations on updates to the uh, to the prostitution and human trafficking laws, and my recommendation was that this came uh, out of that and was one of the recommendations from that small study group. And so then just one one follow up question is, in Title eighteen with the um, limited immunity that you talked about, does that work the same way? Does it does it give a list of drug crimes? or is it more a blanket immunity? No, oh, it just, it pertains to, uh, I'd have to go back and look, but it pertains to, to the drug crime specifically. Okay. Um, Alice, is that, oh, go ahead, uh, Senator Nitka and then Senator White. Is there a quantity limit on uh, the amount that might be present? Yeah, the words, quantity is based on the citations that are contained in that subdivision. So if you look at for, example, uh, you know, it, uh, the, the, whether it's cannabis or cocaine or LSD, it's the first two levels of possession. So uh, if you recall, the way that the drugs, uh, the drug statutes are organized is you have a general one, if you possess any amount, even just the tiniest amount, it'll be a one year misdemeanor. And mm -hmm. then if you possess, and then each statute is different depending on the drug, but if you possess a little more, it will either go to a two-year misdemeanor or it'll go to maybe a three-year felony. Um, and so that's the, that's the second level. And <clears throat> then it'll go higher and those are not included here. So this is just the first and the second level with the exception of cannabis. And that also covers the, I have to, I'll have to go back and double check on this to make sure that it didn't change at all in section 4230 with 164, but it's the lowest levels of possession. So the one and two refer to the level that are the one and two in parentheses here refer to the level. Is that yes, that's that, that would have the amount in each in each statute about what it is. It doesn't cover dispensing <coughs> and sale. Doesn't cover sale. Okay. Yep. That's Just possession. Right. Senator White. So I don't imagine that a human trafficker, him or herself, would report something. But in the paragraph right above there, it says <clears throat> from a person that <clears throat> that a, or a witness of, to a crime that arose um, from the person's involvement in prostitution or human trafficking. Just the involvement. I mean, I can't imagine that the trafficker, him or herself, would would report this, but would it cover if one did? 
Well, you have to look at the crimes for which the person would receive immunity. They, you, you would not receive immunity <coughs> for engaging in human trafficking. Okay, just prost- just so prostitution. Just, just under the, the misdemeanor prostitution. Okay, okay. That's what um, I thought, but... Yep. And, uh, you know, and again, I think if you, when, if you, mm. from additional witnesses, there may be situations where you um, have someone who is engaged in illegal activity, but, uh, and it may fall under, you know, one of these subdivisions here, um, but they, uh, but they're a witness to some other type of crime that, or they're in danger and that they want to be able to communicate with law enforcement um, and, and, they, and they don't want this to be a bar to that. So um, I want to take, I'm, I'm going to think about what Senator Nick had brought up, which is like, if you are someone who is visiting uh, and using the services of a sex worker, what she said, well, could you get immunity for, a, for under prostitution if this, if you report your Self. But I mean, I think the thing is, let's say whether it was a sex worker or their client, let's say if the client is being uh, physically threatened by the sex worker, you want the client to also be able to report and to obtain safety from law enforcement without worrying about that they're going to be prosecuted for, pro- for prostitution, oh. I would guess. It's, I think it, it, it goes both ways. Is your look? At the safety of, of the physical safety of, of folks, and I'm wanting to encourage the reporting of crime rather than charging these misdemeanors. Well, okay. that's, that's a, a key a key yeah. point because in I believe in the the Nordic model, they do pursue um, on on one track they do something like this, and on another track they do continue to pursue the client. Um, and to criminalize the client's behavior. Right. So that's something we should hear from the witnesses about. Right, and you can parse it. I mean, you think about it, if somebody could be visiting a sex worker and they think they're visiting someone who is, you know, by their own free will choosing to engage in that type of work, albeit illegal, it does not uh, have the same treatment under the law as human trafficking understandably. And so someone who goes voluntarily to a sex worker, but then may see something um, once mm-hmm. they visit that person and may say, you know what, I don't think this is voluntary. I think there may be some human trafficking going on here. Um, you well, know, I think that's in, in part why you have in Division One. <laughs> and it goes back to the word involvement. I think Senator White or Senator Nitka landed on that. If involvement means the person who's providing the service, the person who's buying the service, and the person theoretically who might be operating the person providing the service, if they're all involved, then there's a a potentially um, confusing little node there that we should pull apart. Um, And I imagine the house disc or uh, the witnesses will um, will weigh in on that, but it the language seems somewhat vague. I have to say, um, keep going, Michelle. Okay, so again, but just always go back to the only immunity they're getting is for drug crimes and for prostitution prohibited acts. Nothing. Yeah. Else. No. Right, but still, they they could be granted some sort of immunity. Um, so subsection C is the immunity provisions applied to only to the use and derivative use of the evidence gain, gained as a proximate result of the report person reporting to law enforcement that the person's a victim or a witness to a crime that arose from the person's involvement in prostitution or human trafficking. So um, this just means that this is providing immunity to the witness with regard to their statements and that they can't be used against them with regard to those particular crimes. If there is independent evidence that can sustain a charge separate and apart from what was gained with the witness reporting the crime, then that can be used and the person can be prosecuted. What's the derivative use of evidence? Um, That is if you, uh, so if you have a piece of evidence 
And then by having that one piece of evidence, it leads to another piece of evidence that you would not have other known about or discovered without that first piece. Mm -hmm. Makes sense. So it's kind of yeah. the, you've heard the term fruit, fruit of the poisonous tree. So if you can't have, if you can't use the first piece of evidence that leads you to the second, you know, second piece, you can't use the second piece either. Okay. So if, if there's, um, uh, a person in an apartment who notifies police of a, of a crime, <laughs> uh, um, and there are some of these substances in the apartment, police go in, they find the substances, um, they can't, they can't use the, uh, um, uh, Henry, if you could mute. That, oh, that I didn't realize I wasn't muted. I'm so That's sorry. all right. Yeah. Um, so then they, they can't use that line of evidence against them, but then if they busted someone else who sold the drugs there and could provide independent corroboration, they could use that. Right. Okay. Right. So if there was a house that they kind of thought they had some known drug activity, people going in and out, and they'd been kind of aware of uh, drug activity in a particular house, it's not like that just would preclude them from pursuing that based on their other evidence. They just couldn't use the evidence obtained in that particular incident with regard to the reporting of the crime. Mm -hmm. Okay. Any other questions on that? Joe, I can't see you, so just speak up if you have one. I'll holler, but I haven't so far. Okay, keep Good going. Good job explaining use and derivative use immunity, though, Michelle. Oh, thank you. Um, so uh, subsection D is this is if you qualify for immunity up above, then you're not subject to the forfeiture provisions that are in Chapter 84, which is your drug, uh, your regulated drug chapters. Um, so except that contraband can be subject to forfeiture. So if law enforcement arrives based on a call and there are drugs at that location, um, they the person is not going to be prosecuted for the possession if they're within the limits, but law enforcement can confiscate the illegal drugs. Mm -hmm. um, but the person wouldn't be subject to the forfeiture provisions either under the chapter. Mm -hmm. well, Mike, can I ask a question? Oh, go ahead, Senator Nika. So with regard to the forfeiture uh, provisions, I mean, I see a couple of places in Rutland where their whole home was forfeited. And is that, uh, it's, I mean, that's fairly serious. So they wouldn't right. be subject to that. So that wouldn't apply if you qualify for immunity under this bill. I'm sure they'll find a way. <laughs> it's hard to. Okay. Well, anyway. Um, and then subsection E, uh, except in cases of reckless or intentional misconduct, law enforcement is immune from liability for citing or arresting a person who's later determined to qualify for immunity under the section. So, um, so it's basically, you know, law enforcement, hopefully, will, if this passed, would be trained on this issue, would be knowledgeable about this. But if there is an error, someone is um, let's say arrested at the scene for having those drugs. And then once, you know, it's referred to the prosecutor, the prosecutor talks to them. And it, as long as it wasn't reckless or intentional misconduct, then there's no issue for the law enforcement officer. Mm -hmm. And the effective date is this July. Any questions before Michelle takes the draft down? No, thank you. Okay. Um, thanks, Michelle. Sure. So, um, with that, uh, our first witness is Dave Mickenberg. Um, good to see you, David. Nice to be here. Thank you for having me. And I know there was a couple of questions that were raised. I have some formal remarks that I'll sort of read into the, to the record and then happy to, to answer questions. But um, for the record, my name is David Mickenberg. I'm here on behalf of Decriminalized Sex Work, which is a leading national organization advocating for the end of the criminalization of sex work. And just to be clear, at the onset, uh, DSW is an anti-trafficking, we are anti-trafficking advocates at our core. Um, we believe that part of the anti-trafficking effort is the separation of adult consenting sex work from criminal human trafficking. Um, but 
as you know, that's not before the committee today and happy to talk about that at a, another time. Today, we're here supporting a relatively small but important provision that would extend the harm reduction policies known as the Good Samaritan immunity that you all enacted around drug policy um, to sex workers. Uh, at its heart, this issue, like the work that I've done for almost two decades now um, on drug policy is about harm reduction. Inherent to this approach is an acknowledgement, uh, setting aside whatever moral judgments people have of the reality of sex work as part of our state, our nation, and our world, despite its ongoing criminalization. Once we acknowledge that sex work is part of our society, we must then ask the question how we're able to best deal with the potential negative consequences of this work. Um, Vermont right now has an active sex work uh, marketplace. You'll hear more about that. Um, later. Uh, one way you can see it is just simply by going online, searching something like Vermont Escort on the internet, and you can see uh, advertising there. Because this work is happening in the shadow of the law, sex workers face a lot of challenges verifying the identity and the safety of clients before they engage with them. And giving sex workers the ability to contact law enforcement without fear of prosecution will empower workers to advocate for their personal safety in a way which remains unlikely under our current laws. Um, leading human rights organizations such as Amnesty International, Human Rights Watch, the Open Society Institute, the Human Rights Campaign, and the ACLU among just some have taken strong positions in favor of policies that will reduce the harms associated with this work. Countries throughout the world have begun to implement harm, re harm reduction policies associated with sex work, and legislatures around our country have begun to, take, to seriously take up harm reduction policies associated with this work. In fact, um, in the last few years, California passed legislation um, uh, similar to the language that you're considering today. Uh, New York, New Hampshire, Washington State, Rhode Island, Washington, DC have all organized efforts to improve, improve sex work related policies. Um, finally, the legislation you're discussing today really is at its heart anti-trafficking legislation, uh, at least in part. And by allowing the issue of sex work to come out of the shadows through a Good Samaritan law, we are able to focus needed resources on the human rights abusers that are coercing and forcing people into sex work. And we are empowering workers to come forward and work with, with law enforcement to root out these individuals without fear of prosecution. At the end of the day, uh, there should be a public health provision enacted um, to reduce the harms associated with sex work, which can include sexual violence, work conditions, and importantly, the collateral consequences of an arrest. Um, we appreciate that this bill looks to the public health approach and works to respect the lives and, dignities of, and dignity of those that are sex workers in this state. Um, we feel like this language uh, in 103, potentially in H18, will provide a life-saving outlet for sex workers to help ensure their safety and embodies the harm reduction principles Vermont, have embr Vermont has embraced in other areas of the law. So thank you for that brief time, and I'm happy to answer any questions or go back to some of the questions that have been raised uh, in the discussion so far. Uh, any questions for... David Mickenberg. Okay, uh, thank you very much, David. Thank you. Um, our next witness is Henry Binks, co-founder of the Ishtar Collective. Um, and welcome. Thank you so much. Um, first of all, I'd like to give you a greeting. Good morning. Um, I wanna thank the committee for giving an audience so my name is Henry Banks. I am the co-founder and the co-director of the Ishtar Collective out of Montpelier, Vermont. Uh, we're a nonprofit organization that advocates for safer sex worker conditions. Um, we also deal with issues in the LGBTQ community. We deal with general labor issues, issues of domestic <laughs> violence, and we are a non-trafficking organization. So um, this discussion is important to me and the folks that I've known through the years um, and the Vermonters that I work with now. We see this legislation first and foremost as an acknowledgement of our collective humanity and the recognition by you all, the value of our lives. The importance of protecting the health and safety of all Vermonters, including um, erotic laborers. 
I'd like to start by giving you all a little bit of background about myself and why I do the work I do. And then I can talk about how S103 will help the many dangerous situations that sex workers find themselves in. Um, so I am a second generation sex worker, active for almost 10 years now. Uh, my mother was an erotic laborer. Uh, a lot of her experience serves as a constant driving factor for the advocacy I do because much of her story went without proper recognition and was erased by the criminality of her profession. As a result, I kind of watched her mental health and her physical health deteriorate in a lot of silence and shame without proper outreach. Subsequently, she ended her life uh, at the age of 53. I wonder often how her life would have been if she did live in a world that supported her in being who she was. She was a woman that was born in the late 50s um, and more often than not, many of her peers had a more rigid understanding of what right and wrong was when it came to elements of intimacy. She was a bisexual full service worker. She lived with mental illness and she kind of lived, she existed in a time where the only women that were allowed to be out were more prudent, straight, white, and well-behaved. She didn't really fit into that box. By the end of her life, she could only really muster the courage to provide for myself and her through substance use and a revolving door of protection through the men that came in and out of our household. Um, I wonder a lot if she lived in a society that saw her as a more dimensional person beyond the nature of her labor, what the trajectory of her life would have been and if things would have been easier for us as a home. So the heart of this bill and the heart of this advocacy that I do is the vision for collective protection, community. It's a word that we hear a lot in Vermont. And for many, community is about friendly greetings and shovel driveways, post to front porch forum. But for people like my mother and my friends and the people I work with, I think about what it means to be there for one another when things get dangerous, when they get hard. And do we feel like our surrounding community is a safe place to go for help when those dangerous times occur. Um, we do live in a country where consenting sex workers and partners of sex workers, affiliates, and even our, hard, high, our hired security, pardon me, um, could face trafficking or prostitution related charges should the law get involved with a bad date. So that means the life that I live is a constant risk assessment. It means getting creative when I'm vetting a client it means dropping my pin on Google Maps to my friends when I do go on these dates because I know that if things go sour and I call in the police, the possibility for my own arrest is very real. And that arrest could be published or broadcasted along with my legal name and the small and rural towns of Vermont. The stigma associated with these types of public shaming could likely hurt my ability to find housing or stable employment outside of the adult industry should I choose to make that exit. When I was dancing only a year and a half ago in a legal and a regulated space, I was assaulted by a client on negotiating dance prices. And I immediately reported this assault to health security, um, but I was given no protection because that private security was paid off. Likewise, a member of the collective here in Vermont shared a story with me the other day. They're both a parent and a longtime sex worker. They were working years and years ago when a client became violent and subsequently sexually assaulted them. Because of the criminalized nature of their occupation at that time, my colleague felt no confidence to come forward to the law at that moment of assault. Instead, they waited until after when, during an emergency visit to their OBGYN, they were in a pressured environment in which they made a statement that was dismissed by police due to the surrounding circumstance. And that is to say, when the police were made aware that this violence occurred during an appointment, they felt the claim to assault was invalidated by that person's work. The attacks in Atlanta that we all heard about were attacks on establishments perceived to be places of sex work, regardless of whether or not those victims were sex workers themselves. And eight people lost their lives. After the fact, the shooter had full intention of, of attacking a pornography set. Pornography is a fully legal and regulated form of sex work. 
So if we're seeing violence against fully regulated sex work and those even perceived to be doing illegal sex work going up, such as it was in Atlanta, then it begs the question of what do we need to do differently for those who, who we've lost who did not make the evening news. In the days following the violence in Atlanta, likewise, I, my attention has been brought to an uptick of assaults in the sex worker community nationwide. Here I see my siblings in the industry closing in around each other for that protection that the community offers. But unfortunately, none of these victims will see justice through the legal system because their trust in the law enforcement has been strained given the choices they face. Every day, sex workers must make the calculation, risk my health and safety or risk my home, my non-sex work job, my schooling, my freedom. I saw images of my colleagues' faces broken and bruised, crowdfunding for surgery and relocation. And none of their assailants will be arrested because to report their assaults would incriminate themselves. They might face questions like, what were you doing there? Why were you there? What were you wearing? How did you behave? The Good Samaritan Bill could be a multi-layered power of protection here in Vermont. I think it's really important um, to look at this and understand that it could be preventative and not just reactive. Not only could it allow sex workers and survivors of trafficking to report a crime they are witness to or victim of, but they can also use this law to de-escalate a, pot a potentially dangerous situation. An erotic laborer who knows their rights under this law could feel confident calling the police before the moment of violence, or they could evoke their right to call the police if they feel a client is exhibiting behavior that would warrant police action. The fear of arrest would no longer be a tool of coercion for a client or pimp to use in order to exploit a worker or survivor, which is a common tactic of exploitation. Um, often we hear things like, what are you going to do? Call the police. And we have it kind of ingrained in us now you know, this, um, this idea that the response would be your hooker, they won't believe you, they would probably arrest you first. So this bill in particular gives our community, S-103 gives us hope because it says to us that we're humans and that we deserve to be alive and safe. Furthermore, in coercive relationships between trafficking victims and their traffickers, this legislation would provide these victims a way to freedom with a, from exploitation without fear of arrest. Currently under federal trafficking laws, uh, survivors of trafficking are often arrested while the narrative in the courts and in the media is one of rescue. Is there any other scenario in which someone who is being rescued or liberated is handcuffed, put in the back of a car and then thrown into a cage? I don't think that, I mean, that begs the question of whether or not it's rescue at all. And I feel it's our duty to stop the hurtful response to victims and survivors of human trafficking. And I think this bill is the first step in doing that. I take a lot of pride in my residence in Vermont, knowing that our history is one of leading by example. The passage of this bill changes the dialogue between the working people in the industry and the law. And if we can protect, if we could work together to protect all of our laborers in Vermont, we can build trust and combat that life-threatening violence that I spoke of. What we have here today is an opportunity to build, to further build the state's legacy of working together across the political spectrum to create change right here in our community. We were part of the spearheaded effort to give marriage rights to the queer community. And as was forementioned, we've already given a Good Samaritan bill for persons with substance use disorder. Vermont already put in place a law to protect detainees from sexual assault by police because our state recognizes that nobody has the ability to offer real sexual consent when their freedom of movement is controlled by police custody. This was a good first step in building trust with the police. And I think it's imperative that the passage, I think, I think that this Good Samaritan bill is the next logical step. Thank you again for taking time to acknowledge our humanity and hopefully to advance this important legislation that helps to protect part of Vermont that has been forced to live in fear and in the shadows for too long. Um, now I'm available to answer any questions. Thanks again for your time. Thank you. Uh, committee, any questions for Henry Binks? Um, I have a question. Yes. Yes, I'm, I'm just wondering about the part that you, I think you heard us discuss earlier with regard to the, um, the person who's in, who is patronizing um, a prostitute, uh, 
um, I think would come under this. I'm not sure what the exact offense they do when they do patronize a prostitute, but in terms of them being, if they were arrested for that, that they would be, um, they would be forgiven under this or not able to be charged. Or I don't see how this works with the human trafficker who mm. also could get off. Well, I would like to first address the issue of human trafficking. There are a lot of misconceptions in um, major media dialogues as to what trafficking looks like in the United States. Mm -hmm. We have a lot of campaigns that say save our children. Um, a lot of the trafficking campaigns we see with major religious organizations uh, paint this picture where most trafficking in the US is one of a sexual nature. In fact, 80% of the trafficking that takes place in the United States is agriculturally related or related to the service industry. So more often than not, when we see these arrests involving traffickers or traffickees, um, they're really more abusive and coercive relationships between two adults that might be romantically involved. It might be a scenario where one person is a landlord or has some sort of financial control over the person they're exploiting but it's not this kind of Hollywood cartel fuel dialogue that we see often. More often than not, it's a deeper issue, one of consent um, and, and one of active labor exploitation. Um, and I hope, I hope that first part kind of clears up the concerns that people might have that uh, this good sand bill could be protecting traffickers. Uh, us at the Ishtar Collective, we have no intention of advocating for people who exploit other people. Um, at our heart, we are an organization that wants to protect not just our community, but all forms of labor from violence and coercion. Uh, that's why we vet for uh, criminalizing sex between police and detainees. That's why we are seeking collaboration with migrant justice. And that's why we wanna push this bill. We want to empower people who are in trafficking situations to feel safe to come forward and seek that safe way out. So in a moment, imagine if you will, that a person engaging in sex work who's maybe in an exploitative relationship, those things aren't mutually exclusive. I do wanna flag, you can be an active consenting sex worker and find yourself in an abusive relationship or in a trafficking situation. Um, and you can still retain that identity of a sex worker. So let's say that even a consenting sex worker falls into a coercive relationship and they find out that the Good Samaritan Bill has passed. They could make that call to the police or to Circle or to Mosaic or even to Ishtar Collective and feel that much more safe coming forward with their personal story, understanding that they themselves might be immune from catching a charge when they're just asking for outside aid, mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. right? This is. Unfortunately, you know, I don't have a lot of experience in writing laws and policies myself, but I do have a lot of experience in advocating for hard dialogues and, and people that don't get a chance um, to speak their truth to the world. One of the major proponents of rape culture is the fact that we do not believe survivors. So this Good Samaritan bill gives room for the state of Vermont to say, we want to believe our survivors we want transformative justice. We want to protect the people that we might not align with politically, whose labor we might not understand. Thank you. Yeah. So Senator Sears has joined us. Um, Senator Sears, we've done a walk through, th uh, Michelle took us through 103 and we've heard from Dave Mickenberg uh, and Henry Binks um, and just, just finishing up questions for Henry Great. Banks now. Well, I'm sorry I missed the testimony, uh, but we are a citizen legislature. And sometimes we have grandkids to pick up. So thank you for hanging in there, Senator. Senator, oh, uh, Dave, go ahead. I just wanted to just to provide some context for Senator Nicka's question. Um, I, I think because this law is so closely tied to, um, uh, not this law, hopefully law, this le this this legislation, this bill um, is to is clo so closely tied to to what we did around the Good Samaritan law for um, drugs. Um, I think those same types of scenarios 
were raised at the time, maybe eight, nine years ago when we did this, and um, they have not come to fruition. Um, in fact, I think you see the Attorney General um, asking uh, the state of Vermont to, to please utilize our Good Samaritan law. Um, and I appreciate the perspective that Senator Nick has brought about the potential for that. But I think as it's played out, it, at least in terms of our overdose prevention law and our Good Samaritan law related to that, it hasn't been used uh, sort of as a vehicle for, I guess the corollary would be sort of drug dealers to take advantage of the law. That we, we nothing that I've heard of or in the conversations that I've had with law enforcement and others that have been utilizing uh, the Good Samaritan law has found that to be the case. So um, just to provide some context about the potential uh, that you raise. Um, just one quick follow up with Michelle. Michelle, um, if you're still listening. She's there. Michelle, are you there? She's there. Um, oh, there we go. Uh, so I, I see that um, it only immunizes prostitution under this 2632 provision. Is right. there a separate, um, is there a separate provision under which a client would be prosecuted? No. No. So, so um, we. Our prostitution laws are, uh, are terribly out of date. They're about a hundred years old with some, a few little tweaks to them. Um, mm -hmm. They haven't really kept up. So uh, no, it's a pretty blunt instrument. Okay, so we would be immunizing potentially clients and sex workers. Yes, I think anybody involved. And so it could, it could be a client. I mean, I think, uh, I think David, David is right. I definitely recall a lot of discussions when the legislature was doing uh, the Good Sam Law for overdoses around people concerned that um, people who they weren't necessarily targeting as, as around the harm reduction would kind of exploit this. And that was, there was a lot of talk about that and we tried to get the language as possible to address those concerns. Um, so probably talking, connecting with the attorney general's office to see whether or not they have heard of any of those reports or whether or not it hasn't been an issue. I will just, so it, it could be certainly, I'm trying to think of the scenario necessarily where you might have somebody who is a client of a sex worker who calls law enforcement um, and then is immunized from any kind of evidence of a prostitution charge or a drug charge from that location. I mean, I'm not sure why they, why the client would call, um, but uh, unless, there was, uh, they were in danger perhaps, or there yeah. was a certain circumstance that they needed to felt like they needed to reach out to law enforcement. And then again, it's just gonna protect them from being charged with those particular crimes. And I know we keep talking right. and it applies to human trafficking as well as prostitution, but this doesn't immunize anybody with regard to human trafficking, either the client or somebody who is um, uh, trafficking people. Under understood. Um, and, and I understand also that it may be unlikely that somebody would take advantage of that potential immunization, but it's good to know what we're, what we're about, what's, what's covered under the provision. Um, sure, and you could, you, could, um, you, know, you could say it doesn't apply to someone who is, you could do a carve out there, but I think you probably wanna hear from, yeah. from other folks because you know, from a policy perspective, is there, I think most of the time we're thinking about the safety of the sex worker, but it could be that of the client. Perhaps it's the safety of the sex worker and the client because of someone else who was trying to harm them both or something mm -hmm. that they witness that doesn't actually have anything to do with them. Um, you know, does this yeah. principle apply in terms of wanting to protect that client mm -hmm. and them to call and report the crime? Yeah, Hen Henry mentioned the, the shootings. Um, and there were people who were in the process of, um, you know, receiving, you know, the, the services that they had paid for during that shooting, 
who then are going to be looked to as witnesses. And under this, potentially, maybe they would be, they would be immunized. Um, Senator White? So it also, um, and you may have covered this, Michelle, but if somebody is, if, if it isn't, if it's a, a situation where there's more than one person involved there and a client is under the impression that everything is on the up and up and then sees something that they really feel is um, not quite right and want to have an investigation of the the place itself, not necessarily of the of the person with whom they were having their um, liaison or whatever one calls it. But I, so I, I can see that there might be an instance where somebody who is a client might want to want to um, have an investigation. Mm -hmm. uh, Senator Nicka. I think you can certainly see, um, I can foresee a scenario whereby, I, I don't know how it doesn't apply to the human trafficker and something like this. They um, say the police have had cameras scanning the place for, for weeks and they know um, there's going to be arrests um, versus, you know, from people patronizing a certain place. Although they're probably, they certainly need more evidence, but, um, and so they decide they're gonna report themselves first in that they've been going there regularly. They decide I'm gonna report myself first because I don't wanna get arrested. So they call it in. And then, you know, then they would claim immunity. <laughs> I, I can see that would happen with, potentially with the human trafficker too. But there's no immunity for human trafficking. Not for human trafficking, but maybe for it's something- Only that, for the drug. For they're gonna uh, get for the other only target. for drugs or for misdemeanor prostitution. Yeah, well, so and, and even if it was drugs, a certain level of drugs that is presumed to be enough to be selling drugs, they wouldn't be immunized from that allegation. Am mm -hmm. I correct? Mm -hmm. right. Correct. Yeah, there's nothing. Um, so if there's dispensing or selling or anything else, there's no protection. It's just for the possession. Mm -hmm. Lower level. It's for the misdemeanor level and either the the two-year, and then additionally, if there's a two-year misdemeanor or the lowest level felony. It, I mean, it seemed like maybe there should be a, a fine, a piece that could fine tune it so that the, I mean, I mean, I don't really care if someone is patronizing a prostitute. That doesn't matter to me. Jeanette and I have been on this kick for a long time to try and- Yes, we got in big trouble, as I remember once about it. <laughs> We've been trying to do this for years. I still got your draft somewhere in my files. <laughs> <laughs> but- <laughs> but we didn't quite see it as, as exactly this way, but um, if this works, mm -hmm. all right. But I, I really don't want to see someone get off that shouldn't get off. And, and, and I don't care if it's the person that patronizes the prostitute, that's all right. But if they're doing uh, something bad, I want them caught. David, do you want to speak to that? Well, it's just one, one other pointing out as Michelle went through the, the draft, paragraph C does talk about um, other sources of evidence. So this doesn't, so in your scenario, if they have cameras or if they're using um, other independent sources of evidence, I think that, that that would apply. We're only just talking about the, the evidence that would be acquired from the call itself. So hopefully that would, if the police are investigating things, they have a variety of other witnesses and things like that, that all would be fair game for a process, right. for, for, for a prosecution. Right, that's a, that, David's exactly right. And again, that for the debate, eight years ago um, for the other Good Sam law, that was one of the discussions is people saying, well, what if I was dealing and they knew something was gonna go down, could they try to cut off prosecution for those charges because they, by, by calling in an overdose and, you know, or something like that. And again, if there's independent evidence um, that was not obtained as a direct result of the uh, report of a crime to law enforcement, uh, that all can be used. And it's only about the evidence that's gained as approximate use of the phone call to law enforcement to report the crime. Um, it doesn't negate all of that other evidence. Mm -hmm. Or does it prevent them from following up on other evidence outside of that context to investigate the person for those things? 
Senator Sears. Uh, just a question, Michelle. The, the case of Robert Kraft, um, the owner of the New England Patriots, Robert was at a massage parlor um, in Florida, and there were um, cameras there. <clears throat> and um, so he was charged with uh, prostitution you know, soliciting prostitution as a result of what was witnessed on the video. But had Robert been concerned that there might be human trafficking there and had he called um, law enforcement, uh, that wouldn't affect what was seen on the camera. Is that what we're hearing? That the, evidence, right. That, right. the evidence that's already there, mm -hmm. even though he called, I mean, obviously that was, Right. It doesn't favor, destroy that concerned evidence. Concerned about, but it doesn't destroy. And interestingly, that evidence was thrown out um, based on a, some mm -hmm. Florida law. I'm not sure, but the, the case remains that he, um, <clears throat> the video evidence was there. Even if he had called, it, it, mm -hmm. it wouldn't have exonerated him from prosecution. Correct. I want to, uh, and while we're at it, um, I was reminded this morning while we were meeting with Michelle, Bryn, and Eric that back one of the first bills Eric ever did was similar to this, and that was the abandoned baby bill. Some of you may remember yeah. um, where you had a, a woman who wanted to give up her child, but for whatever reason left her at a hospital and was charged with abandonment. And we, we created the law that if you abandon your child at a hospital, um, you didn't have to give your name and so forth to, to, for protection of the child. So, I mean, I, that's a similar law that we passed. And I don't know how much any has been used, but I think there are cases where we wanna protect the victim, um, in this case, prostitute um, over um, any prosecution. In the case of the one that we were talking about, I remember well working on the, the bill on the overdoses of, <clears throat> um, and, and I had had a kid that I had worked with at 204 who died of an overdose um, in an apartment in Rutland um, who easily um, had people called might have been saved, you never know. But since he survived for a while in the hospital before he passed away, I would guess that he could have been saved if somebody called him to eat and he started to um, it, It's, and that, I remember that discussion when we brought up that bill. And it's a similar discussion. I mean, if somebody gets away with something because we, help to save somebody's life that was being human trafficked. And someone got away with something because of this community. I don't know what it is they get away with, but I think it's well worth saving that person's life. Um, I, I, I remember the stories from David Cahill of um, a woman who was being human trafficked in the prostitution in Vermont, um, bringing drugs up from um, Massachusetts. Um, and he was so shocked by it, he didn't want to charge her. You remember that testimony a while back? David Cahill, um, what had happened to this girl in the mm -hmm. Michelle, you said we should hear from other people. Who, who do you have in mind? I think, well, it's totally up to you, but if you would like to hear from some folks, I would suggest David Shear in the Attorney General's office in terms of uh, hearing from, from law enforcement. Um, and the, the language in, for this and the, the policy idea behind it came from a work group between the AG's office, the network, and the center. 
when they were tasked with looking at the human trafficking and prostitution laws and rec making recommendations to you on updating the laws. And this was one of them. And, and so you could have the network uh, and or the center testify. Well, I think I mostly worked, I think with Sarah Robinson uh, from the network on the, on the language. Maybe Peggy, we could find some time next week to hear from Sarah Robinson and David Scher and if necessary, um, if he wants to, Matt Valerio, I just imagine. Uh, maybe extra, but, yeah. Probably Wednesday. What? Yeah, whatever we can, whatever you can make squeeze in there. Um, I don't, um, when it passed the house, it had the sex work study on it, which created all kinds of problems. Had the what? I couldn't understand you. Study of sex work. Oh. There was a, a study, a legislative study created to look at updating the prostitution chapter. But that, what? Why would that cause problems? I think one of the things in their charge was potential legalization right. or decriminalization. It and became very co controversy, controversial over in the House and the bill. We could do a study without having. We're not any... going to. I would appreciate. Well, oh. you, you could do that, but I would appreciate. I think the House um, would prefer not to do a study on this particular bill. Um, so it would be it would be important to get this passed then. Without... Yeah, mm -hmm. I I think we all would agree that, and both Senator Nick and White have been proponents of updating our laws on prostitution, I would suggest them producing a bill to do that. Idea. Maybe we can I'm do it sure in January, we, Alice. I'm not sure we need to do a study on, up, study. you know, we all agree that we need to update our laws. It's, they're similar, well, similar to the law we're just working on, on the S-145, the use of force law and, and the laws regarding um, self-defense. Um, you know, those are had words like mistress and master and stuff like that. And it's so old. But I don't think we need to study it. Yeah. Right. Well. Okay. So, so the idea is then to merge this with H18. Yeah, I've talked with Representative Grad, and because her committee already dealt with this last year, they're comfortable with this, just this particular section. They would probably take it up and look at it once they pass it. Mm -hmm. She understands that we're going to do that. Yeah. Okay. I'm okay with it. Okay. Thank you, Bill. Sure. Uh, Senator Bruce. <laughs> David, thank you once again. Thank and, you. Uh, nice to be here. Henry, I'm sorry I missed the testimony. Um, but it's okay. Um, I hope we have an we, opportunity. The, to the good thing about YouTube is we can catch up. There you go. Yep. Um, and our and our organization is fairly easy to access. So if you ever have any questions, feel free to reach out. Yeah. Okay. Is there anything else, Peggy? If we could, um, I think we time to. Yeah. 